What's up, guys? Uh, my name is Jack. I'm going to be talking to you about how we used React uh, to modernize our front end code base over the course of two years and counting, uh, and the journey that that's, that's been for us. So, first off, uh, a little bit about me. I joined AppNexus in March 2013. Um, I'm a project manager. I was a front end software engineer until October 2014. Um, I have force push master. Uh, and I went back and looked, and this is my first commit at AppNexus. I'm not sure you can see it, but basically they added an inline style to a select. So really starting off on a pretty earth shattering foot there. Um, what is AppNexus? This is this is important to understand why things happen the way they did. AppNexus is the world's leading independent advertising technology platform. Uh, we transact up to 10 billion impressions a day, and that doesn't count the ones we don't transact on, so the actual scale flowing through our platform is many times higher than that. Um, how do clients use our software? Well, they log into our interface to uh, enter orders and check the performance of existing orders or edit those. Uh, sellers of online ad space, i.e. people who own websites, uh, can log in to manage their inventory and uh, see what's happening on it. So who's buying it? What are they paying for it? What ads are actually running on it? Uh, we call that interface console because uh, that's basically what it is. There's about a million buttons and levers and dials. You can also get some reports. Um, we also sometimes call it HPY for historical reasons, everyone's favorite. Um, so let's go back to 2015. Um, Console had basically outgrown its architecture. It surfaced well for a long time, uh, but it was on its last legs. Uh, velocity was low and developer pain was high. Uh, adding or changing functionality was basically a game of Jenga. The stakes are millions of dollars. You're trying to pull out just the right block that gets you what you need without bringing the entire thing toppling down around you. Uh, releases happen once a week and could take 45 minutes if you were lucky or a day if you were not lucky. Um, that page I showed you earlier where you can enter an order, that's the line item create edit page. It's one of the most important pages in console. And uh, it was not in great shape. Uh, 8,000 milliseconds until the user could interact with the page at all. This is something that our clients use every day. That's not good. Uh, 16 seconds to load the whole thing, about three megabytes to transfer it, and 523 requests to bring it all together. So not, not great. Uh, fast forward to now. Um, console is broken up into 15 containerized UI applications. Releases take five minutes and can happen whenever. Um, we're running a modern Webpack Babel ES6 architecture. We have two apps live in Kubernetes and more are being uh, transitioned over. And that same page we refactored it. In fact, some of the people who refactored it, I think are in the room. And, uh, it got 57% faster, depending on uh, how you're measuring it, or 70%, 41% smaller, and 94% fewer requests. So how do we do it? Um, modernizing console in and of itself is not that impressive. We're a tech company, and tech companies modernize our architecture all the time. But what makes it impressive to me is that in 2015, we had zero full-time UI platform developer. And what I mean by that is developers who were focused solely on improving the architecture rather than delivering products to our customers. And that's kind of the, the key point here. As a B2B company, delivering products to our customers is something that uh, we are constantly on the hook for. We've signed contracts, or customers have said, if you build this thing, we'll spend X million dollars with you. That's really important, that's our lifeblood, and we can't sacrifice that basically ever. Um, so to make any improvements to the console, we kind of had to do that old cliche of Changing the engine while the plane is flying, but also the only mechanics on the plane are also the ones flying it, the pilots. So basically, like trying to think of how we're going to fix console, and basically like like that guy. But we did. It. So how do we do it? Uh, we basically leaned on three three tools: React, Agile, and Lean. And uh, now we're chilling up in the cockpit, playing jazz. <laughs> and it's flying itself. 
So um, what is Agile? I think probably a lot of you are familiar with Agile. You've used it before, or you've heard about it. You've had to go through Agile coaching. Um, you've read about it online. You've been on the Agile team. But there's a lot of different versions of it out there, and I wanted to try and find like one sentence that would encapsulate Agile just so we could all be on the same page about it. I did some being online, and uh, I found, found this. <laughs> oh. Oh, no. Oh, jeez. Oof. Okay, yes. Uh, okay, so some people don't like Agile, but we like Agile. Because when you break it down, it's really just about communication, collaboration, and flexibility. That's really all there is to it. Anything else that people say about Agile, they're, they're just blowing smoke. This is, this is it, at the heart of it. Um, the Agile Manifesto, I think, is, is pretty beautiful in its simplicity. Um, if you haven't read it, I think it's great. And if you have read it, I think it's always worth reviewing. It basically says, individual interactions over processes and tools, um, working software over documentation, collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. That's really it. Uh, to paraphrase the Rabbi Hillel, this is the whole of Agile and the rest is commentary. Okay, so that's Agile. What's Lean? Lean is a product development methodology that emphasizes delivering the absolute bare minimum. You can decide what the bare minimum is on your own, but the point is, you figure out what the smallest thing you can deliver is, and you build that and nothing else. Uh, there's some Lean principles here, too, similar to the Agile Manifesto. Eliminate waste, defer, defer commitment, i.e. You don't say you're gonna build something until you absolutely have to. Um, Deliver fast, self-explanatory, and optimize the whole. Optimize the whole system that you're working within. And I was able to find a good quote about this. Mary Poppins says, uh, Lean encourages development teams to respond rapidly and in a disciplined manner to market demand rather than try to predict the future. So basically build against what you already know, not what you think the situation will be six months from now. Uh, so when you, when you put these together, I think you get a pretty good setup. Agile is basically for software development, and it tells you how to build. And how you build is you communicate and you collaborate. Lean is for product development, it tells you what to build. And what you're building is as little as possible. When you put these together, you kind of get a process that looks like this. You identify a problem, you talk to stakeholders, you develop a hypothesis to solve that problem. You build and release something that tests your hypothesis, and nothing more, you measure your results, and you iterate. And if this reminds you of the scientific method, that's kind of deliberate. I actually think that taking Agile and Lean and putting them together um, is kind of like applying the scientific method to software development. Uh, and maybe a, a quicker way of summing that up is, is you're basically doing a loop. You build, you release, and you learn. And you build again. Okay, so, uh, that's Agile and Lean. So I mentioned that we needed a, a problem statement, or something to start with. And a good problem statement should be pressing, actionable, and measurable. Meaning, it should be important, it should be an important problem, obviously. Uh, it should be something you can actually take action against. So, console is bad, it's not actionable. It's pressing, but it's not actionable. And it should be measurable. It should be able to measure how you're doing in solving the problem. So in 2015, we, we had enough. We sat down. We looked at console, uh, we looked at the code, we did some whiteboarding, we looked at what we had to build coming up, and we wrote out the following column statement. And I'll give you guys a second to read it. No, so I'm just kidding. That's not a uh, console problem statement, that's a quote from HP Lovecraft. Um, but uh, console, it's, like, it's not that far from the truth. Console was in pretty bad shape. And uh, I think it basically had three main problems. The first is that it was really inconsistent. We had part of it, which was this spaghetti of PHP and JavaScript and HTML all muddled together, 15,000 line files, not exaggerating, like 300 line functions, uh, trying to dig through those and understand what was happening. Uh, on any given page was kind of a nightmare. Um, we had a new front end, which we called V2. Um, and this was basically uh, an object-oriented JavaScript front end uh, based on the handhold and the module manager. And that was great, but it was, it was inconsistently rolled out. About half of console was on that, and half was on V1. And that meant that there was a really steep learning curve for console. Any given page you were on, 
you would understand it, you would crack it, you would sit with it for a while, you would figure out what was going on, and then if you had to fix a bug on another page, you're starting from scratch. Um, the need to reuse certain components and ideas across console meant that there were forks everywhere uh, or components with huge sets of configuration options, um, just straight up copy pasta. Uh, so rolling out a change to one component did not necessarily mean that every other page was gonna get it. And that was really fast. So you're duplicating effort every time you want to make a change. Uh, and this one really bugged me. Console looked different depending on where you were in console. So here is a uh, pretty standard uh, console module from V1. Uh, it's just a list of publishers. You can search it, you can filter it, you can paginate on it. You can add the publishers to a different list which is not shown here. This is the exact same module in V2. The exact same data, the exact same purpose, the exact same behavior, but it looks different. And like eventually I can see how a client would understand that this was the same thing and get their head around that, but it's not a good look. Um, so a second problem we had was that our monolith was lowering velocity and increasing our reliability. So uh, kind of like the monkeys in 2001, we were just really afraid to, to touch HPUI. It was fragile. Um, this was, the architecture was fine when Nexus was a scrappy startup back in 2009, but we grew really quickly over the next six years. And as the company scaled, this became uh, a source of a lot of problems. Uh, the media releases I mentioned resulted in this crazy like mad dash on Monday to get all your stuff in. So there's all these mergers coming in from different teams. And overlapping responsibility meant that two teams could be working on the exact same page and not necessarily know about it. So that's no good. Um, the third big problem was that the flow of data through an operation in console was really, really hard to follow. Uh, this is a picture of the Ukrainian parliament failing to manage their state, and it represents how we were also failing to manage our state. Uh, state was stored across various components or controllers in V2, and that object oriented pattern I talked about, or it was literally in the DOM in V1. You would read the DOM, you put that into a, a, an object that you would send to the API. It's not great. And this one was like particularly problematic because console is basically a big form that can spend potentially millions of dollars of our clients' money. So data integrity is incredibly important. If we screw up someone's data and they buy the internet, which has happened, uh, because um, we we're managing our state wrong, that's, that's not a good look either. So we decided to start there. Uh, and so we picked this as our first starting problem. Problem number three, the flow of data through an operation is hard to follow. And we had a hypothesis. The hypothesis was, that will simplify our data flow. So we started with a pretty simple component called channelfilter.js. Um, I don't know how easy this is to read, but this is a V2 module. And uh, what's happening here is, this component is initializing like four other components, passing in state, passing in props, building all these uh, interactions between these components. So there's this kind of web of components that the data could enter in one place and flow out the other place, or vice versa, hard to follow. This is the refactored version. It's stupid simple. Uh, the render function takes up most of it, obviously, and it's basically just rendering the view. Um, we did this on the page level as well. This is the big create edit page. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of buttons drop-downs, input fields. Those things can all interact with each other, so what you enter in one place could affect something somewhere else. Uh, so we thought this is a pretty good test case for this new data flow. Can we do this on a page level? And this is a, a diagram that one of our engineers, Joel Griffith, wrote back in 2015 when he was specking this out. Uh, and if you're familiar with React, which obviously you all are, this should make a lot of sense. There's a data controller, which you might call a store now, takes the bit object, passes the entire thing into the page view, it gets decomposed into its various components, and then if any of those components fire an event, that event is registered in the store, and the entire thing is passed back in and it gets re-rendered. This is not like earth shattering or novel, but for console it was. Uh, so we're running a science experiment, so we've got to analyze our results. Right? Um, how did this turn out? Well, the data flow was much easier to reason about. We had a much easier time keeping track of things. It's much easier to read. And the pattern works on multiple levels. That was really important. 
But integrating JSF with our module manager uh, proved to be something of a challenge. So we knew we'd have to solve that. So we felt like we had enough information to validate the hypothesis, or consider it validated. So we were, uh, we were feeling pretty good. <laughs> pretty, pretty good. Pretty good, OK. Uh, so we knew we wanted to roll React out across console, but we were going to run into obstacles if we had to do it um, in this model. Why don't we break that up? So this is our second problem that we decided to try and tackle. And the hypothesis was basically microservices will increase velocity. And microservices here just means uh, a smaller app that has one job or one set of functionality, as opposed to having one app that has all the jobs and all the functionality. So, uh, you know, before we were kind of afraid to look at the monolith or, or go near it, we said now we're gonna, we're gonna get down and study it and see, see what we can do with it. Or, to use movie, I actually think it's a lot better. We were gonna break it up. Um, so we, we started with a, uh, a product called the Unified Server of Record. And uh, this was basically a new customer segment that we hadn't addressed yet. Um, it was a sufficiently different use case that it didn't really make sense to try and build this on an existing screen. So we wanted to do something new with it. Um, at the same time, I mentioned that consistency problem. This was something we knew we wanted to address early on. The breakout should be transparent to the end user. You shouldn't know that this is a different application. Uh, so we went ahead and did it, and this is it. Um, this was a, this is a screenshot of an early version of it, but this is a production screenshot. It looks just like console. It's it's the same. Um, this it uses a React and data flow to prove that or other. So now that that data flow works on a component level, page level, and an application level for us, that was really important. We're free from the HPUI baggage. There's no more PHP. There's no more API proxy code living there. Uh, but like I said, we want to maintain consistent UX. And we don't want to rewrite business logic because that's kind of risky. So we've got to share some stuff. So, oh God, we pulled in all of HPUI as an NPM module. So that's not great. Um, in this GIF, I think Al Pacino represents HPUI. But he pulled back in. So what are the results of this experiment? Well, we know it can be done. The underlying architecture of this application is much cleaner than HPUI. We like that. But maintaining consistency as we continue to break these applications out is going to be a challenge. So that was the next thing we wanted to solve. So we felt like the process, once again, was validated. Mostly. The idea was right, but the execution was going to require a lot of work. So uh, now we get to uh, this first one, back to the first one. The front end is inconsistent, and if we don't do something, it's going to be more inconsistent as the monolith continues to decompose. So the hypothesis we came up with was that uh, an internal open source shared component library will help us increase consistency. This is not like a new idea, but it was new for AppNexus, and what we called it was ANX React. Here's the first component in ANX React. Just a humble button. Pretty simple, that's the entire thing. Uh, it comes with its own styles. So uh, what this basically means is that anyone who wants the AppNexus button and pull this in and get the AppNexus button. And we opened it up to everybody. So if you wanted to build the AppNexus dropdown or the AppNexus text field, you could do that too. And everyone else would be able to use it. So uh, what happened? Well, here is a visualization of ANX React between May 2015 and the end of the year. And this big green bottom down here is the components folder. Uh, and you can see that it's, it's getting a lot of attention. People are really digging it. People are adding a lot of stuff to it. And it kind of enabled this virtuous cycle where the more stuff was in there, the more enticing it was or worthwhile it was to do the work to pull it in. And then when it was in, if there was something it was missing, you could easily contribute back to it, which made it even more enticing for the next person. So it kind of developed its own momentum. Um, so first commit was in May 2nd, uh, 2015. And over the next eight months, we got 1,600 commits and 23 app vaccines, resulting in 60 components. Uh, so we thought it was pretty good. Showed a lot of promise. Uh, it had broad adoption and enthusiastic contribution, which was what we were looking for. Um, it enabled breakouts without pulling in all of HPUI. And it sped up our factors because 
if you were building a new page, you got all this stuff out of the box for free. Uh, however, we realized at the end of the year that um, the fact that it was just this internal open source thing and had no formal oversight was kind of recreating the inconsistency problem again. Since anyone could contribute to it, we had all these different opinions about styling or abstraction or composition that were built into the library. And it was kind of like getting all over the place. Um, actually, I think this is wrong. Everyone agreed on the level of testing. Uh, the level of testing we had in there was basically zero. <laughs> so, uh, what's the verdict though? We felt like the hypothesis was validated. Like, the idea was right. Again, it just needed some oversight. So this kind of got us to our next problem. Uh, related, but a little bit different. So how do we solve that? We wanted to solve that by uh, officially investing in oversight, by creating the first dedicated um, UI platform team. And that oversight uh, became expressed as an actual open source library called Lucid, which is on GitHub. You can go check it out right now. Um, here's the that ANX React button. And here's the same button in Lucid. It does the exact same thing, but you can see there's a lot more going on. The prop types are enumerated, it's self-documenting, there's great comments, and this goes on and down pretty far. Uh, one thing we also did was, before we even started building components, we had our very talented visual designer, a guy named David Maloney, go through and create mockups for every state the button could be in, down to the pixel level. So we knew we were nailing the UX consistency thing from the start, we felt pretty good about that. Uh, here's that old um, V1 publisher component, here's a V2 publisher component, and then here's what the publisher component looks like today in ANX React. Um, same functionality, but it's much cleaner, and it's much cleaner under the hood too. So what Lucid actually did was it became the, the building block for every higher order component in ANX React. And it sort of forced all the ANX React components to conform to these new patterns that Lucid was expressing. So we created this tool that essentially enforced consistency everywhere else in console. Uh, this, is, this is the thing that I think is the most telling about Lucid. The blue line here is a graph of um, ANX React adoption in terms of number of components instantiated over the second half of 2016. The orange line is that same graph for Lucid. So we felt like we were on to something and uh, we had created a solution that was appealing to our coworkers. So what are the results? We got full adoption across App Nexus UI applications. The library itself has 91% code coverage, so we feel like we solved the testing problem. Uh, like I mentioned, we uh, basically forced all these ANX React components into the future, uh, and we considered the hypothesis validated. And uh, now we're feeling, feeling really good. <laughs> That's John, he's, the, he's one of the guys on the Lucid team. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. I've lost over a lot of stuff, but that, that covers a lot of the journey. And I want to close by talking about this. Um, we really found it really beneficial to focus on adoption. Because we didn't have a dedicated team who could refactor console and just spend all our time doing that, because there was no one going around all the teams at Nexus and saying, you must, lose, you must use Lucid or you must use AMX React, we felt like we had to create something that um, people would adopt on their own. Uh, I think there's a lot of projects and tools out there that start with uh, a certain kind of mentality. And I don't want to knock this at all. It's a lot of great stuff has come out of this. But it's kind of, it's kind of like if you build it, they will come. And, and that's, that's great. But it doesn't work that well for us because change is hard. And everyone's under pressure to deliver. When you're under pressure, you naturally want to optimize for short-term velocity. And there's nothing wrong with this. Like, this is, this is our job. Our job is to deliver things to our clients. Wanting to speed up the pace at which we do that in the short run is totally understandable and that's fine. Um, but it basically, it does mean that people um, will always kind of think twice if you ask them to improve their code base when they're trying to do something else. And uh, the last reason that, that this is hard is because developers have opinions. Um, Shocking, I know, but you can't just build something and trust that people will agree that it's the right solution. You have to entice them. And so I want to suggest a different model that we used, which is 
what I call the help me, help you model. Uh, and I think a way to sum this up is to basically say that the best way to get someone on board with something you think they need is to wrap it in something they think they need. Kind of like a delicious bacon-wrapped almond stuff tea. Um, the only way to find out what they need is to ask them, and that's agile. The only way to make sure you built the right thing is to actually deliver it and find out. So, in other words, you build, you release, you learn. That's it.